yeah I was getting used to <laughs> everything going wrong at this point and unbeknownst to Rick Penta when he was making some necks there something went really wrong with his CNC machine so what had happened was in between the 6th and ninth frets there was somewhat of a dip on the neck itself I didn't know to look for this when I first got the neck because hey I knew it this stuff you know so <laughs> what happened was I had taken the fretboard just following some instructions and went and traced out the fretboard go and cut out the fretboard to the neck and then I sanded everything down then I went and put my tuners in I put a string running down the whole length of the fretboard so I could see this and the high E string was like hanging off of the fretboard uh, I knew that probably wouldn't work too well when you're trying to play guitar so I just I was like hey! but then Tony came to the rescue Tony had this really great idea. He, he had to ponder it for a week first, but then all of a sudden he came, he goes and picks everything up. What he had done was he pretty much just cut these, these rabbit cuts with a router on both sides of the neck. And then he filled that up with maple and he had this ingenious idea for the fretboard. He ended up running these ebony strips down both sides to give it more fill because it had been cut in too far. So now all of a sudden it looked like we had this really cool design change as opposed to trying to fix an error on there. I didn't say this on video right now though. It seemed at this point there was nothing to get in Virgil's way to complete the build. He knew he could get by with a little help from his friends. I just hate to sound like an optimist but when we were running into problems and it was taking us a little bit longer to do things, that extra time was giving us more time to come up with more ideas for the guitar that was never going to be finished. The day finally came when I was able to hammer in the fret wire on the fretboard. This was pretty exciting but I was pretty nervous and I start bashing away at it and <laughs> it blows out all this inlay up on the 23rd and 24th frets. I freaked out. And I, you know, there wasn't a lot of people who had experience to actually put in fret wire where you have inlay going across the fret slots. So therefore, what I ended up having to do is, and this luthier on the official luthier forms suggested to me that I use what's called as a fret call. Also, I was trying to bend the fret wire by hand and I ended up getting a contraption from Stu Mac where I was able to bend the fret wire. So now I had nice bent fret wire, correct, correctly bent fret wire, and I had this press call to actually just, you know, press in these frets. And I had to do some filing in there as well. So there was a few different elements to get that going, but as soon as I got it going, it was going on. On February 25th, 2011, Virgil had started cutting the dragon's pieces. He finally had them ready to be inlaid by April 14th. The cracking of the ebony finally subsided after a few days. It was getting used to its new home. I was hanging out on the porch with the body and you know it was only about 120 degrees out here. Humidity 98 percent and then I'd take it in, I'd put it next to the air conditioner. I'd talk to it a lot. I became one with the guitar body. Finally got used to its new home. I, had, I definitely had to fix up where all those cracks were but it finally uh, settled down and I was able to start the inlay of the dragons into it. Things were finally coming together. The dragons were finally in late, and now it was time for some frosting on the cake. Tony kept on surprising me along the build. He kept on coming up with these crazy ideas. One of the ideas he had, though, I definitely jumped on. How did I come up with the idea of the dragon's teeth? Uh, or shark teeth, I'm sorry. It was prehistoric shark's teeth. I mean, come on, that's like perfect if you're gonna be inlaying dragons into a guitar, right? You know, he was just, he, he was, the detail that he was using was so incredible. And I just thought, let's do something totally unique, off the wall, I guess I'm off the wall, as you can say. And I thought, you know, what, what more to add to this amazing guitar than something that's prehistoric? When he mentioned these <laughs> prehistoric shark's teeth, I was like, this is a madman. He's out of control. And I was like, but it was a brilliant idea. Probably, I don't know if it's ever been done. I just thought this would be a really cool look. I started doing research on shark's teeth 
that was from the Megalon era, you know, five to 22 million years old or whatever. So I ended up uh, getting all these shark's teeth. I don't know, I wound up with about 500 shark's teeth that I started uh, sorting through. It was cool. Shark's teeth, I mean, come on. Who's putting that in guitars these days? As Virgil started inlaying the dragon's teeth, his wife, Lori, came up with a strange idea. He, of course, went overboard and did puppy's teeth. When our two dogs were puppies, you know, puppies lose their eye teeth, especially when you're playing tug of war with them. And my wife had suggested that I use these puppy's teeth because I guess she saved them. She only found one tooth and I kept on bugging her saying, where's the other tooth? I was ready to give her a pair of pliers. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, two weeks later, she finds this other puppy tooth and I was able to inlay those into the horns of the dragon's nose. At the end of the dragon's inlay, Virgil was finally able to inlay the sterling silver tongue and whiskers on the lower dragon and 14 karat gold tongue and whiskers on the upper dragon. Every week that passed, I was trying not to think of the fact that, oh dude, you only got like thousand hours into this, you could mess up anything you want. I was pretty nervous, so the ante kept on getting raised as time passed, and the most crucial steps were, were about to take place. These steps were including the routing out of the pickup cavities, control knob holes, electronic cavity, as well as setting the neck. Virgil finally neared the end by making the control knobs and lastly, the truss rod cover. I didn't really even think about the truss rod cover until the day came to where I had to make it. So when I finally made it, I had used uh, koa wood around the edges of it. It was African black wood in the center of it. And then I had gone crazy with the inlays on there. There's like highly figured white mother of pearl. There's black mother of pearl in there. There's 14 karat gold. And the list goes on. And finally, Virgil etched the lines into the mother of pearl. Etching into the mother of pearl is pretty nerve-wracking because as you're going and hitting this thing up with this really, really sharp blade, if you mess up at this point, like, oops, it, it, it's not like you have an eraser where you could fix it. You basically would have to take out the whole piece that you inlaid, you know, by recutting and all that stuff. So it, it only sets you back a couple hours or a couple days, depending on how bad you messed up and what you messed up. It was finally time to send it off to Mo Colors to get its poly finished. It was quite a long wait on Mo. He ended up having like tons of guitars that he was trying to get out, get finished. And I used that time to start designing another guitar. Seven weeks later, Virgil finally got his guitar back from Mo. I was so excited the day I picked up the guitar from Mo. I finally got to see what this thing was gonna look like with a finish on there, but I was also equally excited to get the thing finished. I still had to do my fret leveling, there was electronics to put in, there was a lot of little tweakings to do and trying to get your setup done. So I knew it was going to be at least two weeks to get it finished, but I actually had that knocked out in about four days. I had finally arrived to that day where I was going to plug in my guitar and give it a shot. This is this is rewire number four, and we're gonna see if this works. <laughs> That's all it's been doing. Oh my god. Well. Oh my god. A bad note? No. <laughs> it works. <laughs> was kicking my butt and the reason is because I had the wiring actually correct but I thought I had it wrong and I was finally able to meet up with a couple different local luthiers who eventually solved the problem. One was Ben Chafin and he actually gave me uh, an authentic PRS electronic switch because he thought it could be the switch and he thought it might be the pickups so I took the switch from him then later that day, I got to visit Charles Scroggins. And Charles was really excited about the build for me because he knew it was my first guitar. So he ended up installing this switch. And 
he tested the wires and he saw that there was a faulty wire in the bridge pickup. Then I finally got to plug it in and play it. So I actually played it up at Charles' shop and that was pretty awesome. And so ends the story of a man with a dream who conquered problems along the way to have a vision unfold before his very eyes. I ended up bringing it down to Todd Grubb's studio and I wanted to, wanted to see what uh, the guitar master really thought of uh, the Dragon Master's guitar. So he went and plugged it in. He tried it. He, he thought it was all right. Okay, heading off to um, Todd Grubb's studio. We're almost there. Woohoo! Here we go. Wow. Man, that is something else. Boy, I love the headstock right off the bat. The headstock is the first thing a guitarist actually looks That's at. That's the first thing guitarists look yeah. at, isn't it? And you know what? <laughs> uh, custom guitars or un guitars that aren't, you know, a brand name, the headstock always sometimes looks a little generic and a little weird at first. Mm -hmm. This one always looked classic. Right. That, that was good. <laughs> Man, I like that the width of the, the body. It's a nice shape. Nice weight it, too. It is, it is. It really when you is. put on your um, lap too, you're gonna see the balance of it. And I just uh, lucked out with that. So Man, it is, it is, it's nice, man. It really has a nice tone. It plays fantastic and it's an amazing looking instrument. I don't know what, how it could be better. Dragon man. It actually came together, all the coloring was just amazing. The, the depth of, of all the uh, different tones of wood, and of course the finish was unbelievable. I just want to build some more guitars. I don't really know what this guitar looks like for the first time. It's because I ended up cutting every single piece that you see on it. So therefore, I don't have that really cool, wow, that's a neat guitar. I'm, I'm sure it looks cool, There's there's been really good feedback on there, but really, I just want to build another guitar. All along we had that vision that what it's going to look like, but once it was in our hands, it's like, oh my god, I can't believe how amazing he did. Uh, truly, I, I mean, I, I had the vision that he had the talent, but I just, the way it came out, I was incredibly impressed. And every time I look at it, I see something different on it, and, and I watched him build this thing from the beginning, and I still see different details that I was like, oh wow, I didn't, forgot, I didn't realize he did that. So, you know, I, I think he, uh, he's on to something. You know, he, he definitely, he has the passion for it. And, uh, you know, like I said, I think there's gonna be uh, a lot of beautiful guitars to come. At the end of the day, if I'm sanding, <laughs> I gotta sand something and I'll be happy.